Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Easy Conversations, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia, and I'm really excited about this week's episode as I am joined by Dr. Kashif Perzada. Kashif and I met in university way back in the day. Uh, Kashif is now an emergency physician. In this episode, Kashif talks about his experience as a frontline worker and what he has witnessed with COVID-19. He gets into detail about what we as the general public need to do to protect ourselves, uh, things that can put us at risk, and how to minimize those risks around COVID-19. I'm hoping you can get as much out of this episode as I did, and I'm grateful for the work people like Kashif are doing behind the scenes. If you want to find Kashif on social media, he is on Twitter at Cash Prime. That's at K-A-S-H-P-R-I-M-E. So let's just get into it. Hey, Kashif, good to see you. Uh, how are things on your end? Good to see you again after all this time. Um, yeah. So far, so good. Um, as good as can be expected. Uh, work is getting busier. We're starting to see a lot more COVID cases. Uh, probably seeing one or two critically ill ones every shift at the hospital. Um, the young family is good too. Um, you know, how, I guess everyone's going through this, how to navigate the usual stuff, uh, groceries and everything like that. Um, but yeah, so far so good. How about you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. No, uh, I'm, uh, again, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, I'm super excited about having this conversation and, and kind of share your perspective. So just for the listeners out there, uh, you know, can you tell a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, um, what you do and what are some of the things you're seeing? And then we'll kind of get into some of the, the things you're seeing on this COVID side. So I'm an emergency physician. I practice mostly in Toronto at a couple of hospitals. Um, I also um, head up a group called um, Masks for Canada. We've been pushing for mask bylaws across the country as well. Uh, so far, my professional work it's basically on the front lines, you know, uh, seeing, um, you know, cases, suspected cases, and juggling that with the young family as well, which I think a lot of people are going through as well. So that's from my end. Yeah. And how long have you been doing the, be, like, been an emergency physician? Oh, about 13 years now. So well, no spring yeah. chicken uh, <laughs> since, we, since we were at McGill together long ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. And, uh, is like in terms of challenging years, where would you put this year? Oh, I think it's probably the, aside from, you know, just when you're starting out in practice and you're trying to figure everything out, this is probably the worst year ever. The yeah. year from hell, basically. Yeah. So, like, so it's you, crazy that, that um, a job that you love doing becomes deadly if you make a very, even one small mistake on something like during a procedure. That's absolutely. That probably, you know what, I think the worst year before this was 2003. I was a medical student during SARS um, in Toronto and it was, I was quarantined. So um, that was probably the second worst year, but this is much worse because that was about four months, five months. And this is, you know, carrying on till now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And then you mentioned you have a young family. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, you had a newborn uh, around March or April. Um, how was that experience and how has it been? Because uh, I know you had to quarantine or, or stay separate from your family when you, because of work. Exactly. Like, so the, um, it was, the delivery itself, it happened right on the weekend of the lockdown um, when it happened. And then, you know, we, I was obsessively sterilizing the whole hospital room with Lysol wipes and everyone in that ward thought I was nuts. Like I was wearing um, masks everywhere. I'd ask the staff and um, the other patients about what they were worried about with the coronavirus and everyone looked at me as I was from Mars. So obviously a lot of perception has changed since then. Uh, a lot of it is navigating, you know, a lot, like a lot of people are getting childcare is very difficult. Like in the lockdown, uh, we had my mother-in-law Maroon, who was from the Maritimes. So that, that was a big bonus for us. Uh, but yeah, getting childcare, like the older kid, we have a two and a half year old who's supposed to start preschool. That yeah. obviously didn't happen. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, anyone with young families knows the struggle. It's, uh, it's been a lot tougher. Um, you know, basically all your time and more goes to taking care of them. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you know, when, when you guys were obviously having the baby, uh, you were 
obsessive about cleaning, keeping the room clean. So why did you feel differently at that time compared to the rest of the hospital staff? And what's, why is their perception changed now? I think it, a lot of it has to do with uh, going through the first SARS in 2003. And, you know, the, the paranoia and the fear that spread through us all at that time, uh, maybe the staff had, hadn't been through that and turned over since then. Um, so that really helped um, guide me on that. Like we, at that time, we didn't know how, how dangerous this was. Like SARS was extremely contagious. So we were careful to wear masks like every, for every second in the hospital. And we had to be careful about what we touched. Um, so I think that that informed it, but I was also watching news very carefully um, abroad, like anyone who paid any attention to news in China or in Europe uh, knew that this was coming. And it's kind of a bit shocking to me that it caught uh, the government here by surprise when it did. And it yeah. Have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think looking back, everyone's questioning some of the decisions, but unfortunately hindsight's <laughs> 2020, right? So uh, exactly. Yeah. It's a once in a, century event right it's really hard to plan for that absolutely and and so how was it when you know when you guys brought the baby home and you had to like kind of be separated you know obviously uh i mean i remember being excited about having my baby home and being able to play with them so how was it different in your case considering your line of work so i was lucky in that uh, my colleagues after seeing that media article about our case that took a lot of my shifts so period of separation was very short, thank God. Uh, but it was very difficult. Like um, we had a whole isolation suites in our basement in the house. And we're lucky that we were living in a house at the time. Imagine living in a condominium or something like that. Yeah. Uh, very, very difficult. Um, but I was very lucky that um, I had my uh, mother-in-law here to take up the slack as well. So. No, oh, that's good. Um, yeah. Family, family support is always good at the in those times. Um, yeah, so I mean, I really want to get your perspective on what it's been like as a frontline worker, um, you know, being in the hospital and seeing some of the cases like, uh, you know, I, if you could share your experience. So I think one thing is um, we've, uh, at, at my hospital, the main one where I work, only one person out of 400 people got sick in the last eight months. And we're still looking at a winning streak like that because we were ultra cautious yeah. And it's not, it's a regimen that you have to do and you can't relax for one second, really, when you're dealing with uh, an infected public. And we're in one of the high prevalence areas of Toronto. So one thing is this constant vigilance that you have in your mind. It's um, constant exposure to danger it has a mental toll on you, um, which I think we're not really scratching the surface of right now. Um, physicians and nurses think of themselves as, as superhuman at times. Um, when they're especially when they're dealing with with death and life at every turn but i think you're gonna we're gonna deal with a, quite a toll of of mental health problems as things go on at the same time though like people are um, more resilient than we give credit for like you look at the transformation in the public mm -hmm. like you know most of the public has really adopted a lifestyle alien to them uh, in a short amount of time and we've really kept the lid on things you know the numbers are not great, but in other countries are much worse. Um, we've kept a lid on this while keeping most of the economy open. So I think everyone should be proud of all the steps that they've taken and how the big changes they've made in their lifestyle in such a short amount of time. So short answer, it is a very different environment. It's an environment of constant risk. Um, it's a little riskier than the average public, but I think you know we'll have to keep going like this hopefully until a vaccine comes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of a vaccine, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I, I hear about a lot of the decisions or changes like, you know, uh, in my case too, just being at work partially uh, and then working from home and a lot of it hinges on a vaccine. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, do you feel like it's going to be a slam dunk or it's going to be a bit of a transition period? I think it's going to be a transition period just because of supply. Like, I think the Canadian government has a line on five different vaccines. We don't know which ones are going to be the most effective. I'm hopeful that they'll work. Um, the trials so far that I've read of uh, look very promising. The other thing is if you look at the antibody treatment that Trump got, um, the Regeneron is an antibody similar to what the vaccines are targeting, uh, are aiming to produce in the body. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to work. So 
just from that anecdote and from the trials of those type of treatments. Uh, I think, you know, the vaccine pessimism that, you know, there's uh, that none of the vaccines will work, I think is misplaced. The issue is distribution. Like we'll probably start seeing significant numbers of them in uh, February, March, but how do we get, you know, 35 million people vaccinated in a short amount of time, which is something that's never really happened before. And you might need multiple doses. So I think we'll have a period probably from spring to late summer where everyone will, will get the shot eventually. And then after that, we'll probably go back to normal life. Yeah, for sure. And, and in the current time, like, are you seeing, um, like, so I know prior to this, we were talking about the number of cases, but are you, is the second wave concern that people had, is that real right now? And Oh, definitely. Especially where you are in Alberta. I think yes. You have outside of Manitoba, the worst uh, infection rates in the country. And I don't think your government is dealing with it as effectively as it should. Um, in Ontario and in Quebec, um, we had a second wave that started about a month ago, a month and a half ago. And then stronger measures were put in about uh, four weeks ago. Uh, and that seemed to have sort of stemmed the tide so far. That was basically closing bars and restaurants. A very mild measure. Like if you look at it, bars and restaurants are a tiny, tiny slice of the economy and it's kept the rest of the economy going. Unfortunately, there's some backtracking here on that, which I hope will be reversed. But yeah. I think um, in Alberta and Manitoba, you're dealing with a much graver graver outbreak. You're going to have much worse outcomes unless the government's there. And I think they're already doing it in Manitoba and Alberta. The government doesn't show any interest in doing any kind of restriction uh, so far. Well, they've re reduced uh, the number of people in social gatherings but yeah i mean there hasn't been any drastic changes like quebec and ontario for sure um and yeah i mean every government's tra treating it differently um so did you see with, so when, with the measures that ontario took for example did you see changes in the numbers uh well definitely like even yeah. even just working like um in september I, I was seeing one or two critically ill covid patients a shift and, um, you know, in my shifts last week, I didn't see any, like it was, I, maybe I saw one, one, um, just anecdotally, right? So the numbers yeah. are coming down, we're plateauing sort of at a certain level. Our ICU didn't completely fill up. If you look at Manitoba, um, their ICUs, ICUs are full. They're gonna have to start transferring people out or they're gonna have to use alternate resources. Belgium uh, is a country that's used up all its ICU beds. They're going to have to start transferring people to Germany, assuming Germany's not filled. So yeah, it's a real concern. Like you can't like uh, just wish this away. Like the science is 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 uh, something that you can't argue with. The virus is there; it doesn't change. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what your ideology is, if you're conservative or liberal or whatever. Yeah, uh, it's the the fact of the matter is, this thing is going to fill your hospitals if you're not careful. Yeah, no, that's fair. And and that's a valid point. And I think a lot of the lockdown in the beginning, uh, in my perspective, was because of that, because we didn't have the the resources or the infrastructure to be able to contain all the potential cases that would have take, come in, right? Exactly. And now we do, like, we have a population that's better trained. Um, you know, they're wearing masks in the public areas. Uh, the people are more careful. So, you know, all it would take is some mild measures and maybe Alberta can do this, can do as well as we did here. Like, I think the ultimate, ultimate gold standard is to what the Maritimes did is um, lock down like the, the external borders and quarantine infected cases and try to return to a normal life. Like I really envy my relatives uh, out there. That <laughs> they're really, they're basically living a normal life right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as a frontline worker, um, what have you seen overall uh, in over the last few months and what would you caution people uh, with in terms of measures they should be taking on a day-to-day -day basis even so one thing i should say is people should not assume that this is only a disease of elderly people i've seen plenty of uh, middle-aged people with it um, especially the ones um, uh, who need to go on um, oxygen or ventilator and they have that dumbfounded look like how how could it be me right yeah. Everyone assumes that they're not the ones, but it's completely random who's going to get it, who's going to get it bad. You know, uh, the odds are good if you're if you're younger, but it's not zero. And it's still, you know, 10 times worse than the flu. And the flu itself is no benign illness. Yeah, so that's what I'm seeing is that uh, I'm seeing a lot of COVID fatigue, like people uh, who are going to parties and social gatherings. I'm seeing, you know, people admit to that when they come in sick. 
And I think, you know, that needs to stop. Like this is, uh, you know, I think maybe people just can't discipline themselves for that long or some people can't, but that has to stop because they're, they're going to either get really sick themselves or they're going to make their elderly relatives very sick. Yeah, that's fair. And, and what kind of measures other than that, like on a day-to-day -day basis, even like just doing, you know, the mundane tasks, like what should people be mindful of in your perspective? Oh, so I think um, it's gotten fairly clear that masks are very important and watching hesitancy around policy for them, especially in the West, like in BC and Alberta is really disturbing. Um, I think wherever people interact, um, people should be wearing a mask like Teresa Tam mentioned, a triple layer homemade or a store-bought mask. They're not hard to find these days. Like you can get a box of 50 for, you know, 15 bucks now. Um, they're, they're everywhere now. The supply chain is really caught up. So that's one important thing. The other thing is everyone should be very wary of being in any enclosed space with another person for very long uh, without really good ventilation. So if you, uh, that would include like a small office if it's not being vent ventilated well. Even if you're wearing masks, you're at risk because some aerosols will escape and get to your um, to the people in the room. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a room you have to make sure that there's at least, this is a technical term, at least six air changes per hour with fresh air um, to keep uh, cycling any aerosol particles out. So I'll give you one example. So what I've changed is that I don't, we don't go grocery shopping anymore. Like we use delivery. There's a lot of online delivery of groceries now. Um, yeah. We avoid any indoor space um, as much as possible. And whenever I do go to work, I'm wearing, um, masks and um, head covering and goggles um, to protect myself and everyone else there at work is wearing the same thing. Um, so I'm not seeing that in the general public. I think, you know, the public should really, really, even if restaurant dining is allowed as it's being allowed in Ontario now after the restrictions, you probably shouldn't go. Um, you're putting yourself at unnecessary risk unless it's outdoors somehow with a good airflow. Basically. That's what I would say, two things. Wear masks at, um, at all times near other people and stay away from closed indoor spaces with poor ventilation. Right, because in a restaurant, you don't know what kind of ventilation is there, right? Or even a bar. Yeah, you have no idea. Like, But if, if you're outdoors on a patio with a heat lamp or if it's a restaurant where everyone's wearing their jackets and the windows are wide open, that's, that's, uh, that's probably much safer than a restaurant where, where, it's, uh, where the air is recirculating and there's a ton of people inside. Right. Yeah. And then I know you touched on it earlier, but a lot of people do believe that, you know, they're healthy, they're active, and they're probably not at risk. Um, what are your, I know you said it's pretty random, but how would you, like, if you had to provide some details on what, how you can contract it, even if you're healthy and active or young? So this, um, this virus is much more contagious than flu, um, two to three times as much. So you can get it much easily. Um, the other thing is, you know, imagine it like, would you want to play Russian roulette? Like um, in general, like do you imagine, except that, you know, the gun has a thousand chambers in one of them. Let's say you're 40 or 50, right? Yeah. So the gun has, um, let's say uh, 200 chambers or 500 chambers and one of them has a bullet and you have, you get to play that uh, every time you're exposed to someone in front of you. Is that a game you want to play really? Yeah, that's, yeah, no. That's one way to think about it. It's not like one in six, like, you know, you're a standard revolver, but one in 200, one in 500 or so of getting seriously ill. Right. And and I guess if you have any pre-existing health conditions, whether it's uh, even asthma, uh, which is fairly common amongst the population, um, including well, myself. Yeah, like asthma, asthma not as much, but um, blood pressure, diabetes, and even obesity. Like if your weight is not ideal, like if your BMI is above 25, so uh, you're a little chunky, then you're at much higher risk of uh, getting worse complications. Right. Yeah. And and for me, you know, I've heard about people even with asthma uh, being at higher risk. Uh, and for me, that's important because I am asthmatic too. So um, is that a concern? Oh, definitely. Um, but not as much as the metabolic stuff like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. There's something that seems to happen to those folks that makes it much, much worse. Right. And, and in the event you do have symptoms or, you know, or if, even if you're asymptomatic, what is your suggestion with that? 
Um, if you ha if you actually get COVID. Yeah. Okay, so firstly, um, you'll have to follow your local public health guidelines on isolating and quarantining yourself um, and your contacts and your family. Um, you'll have to talk to a contact tracer to find out who you might have been exposed to and who you might have exposed. Um, treatment wise, there's multiple stages in COVID. Um, the first stage is usually like a, f a very mild flu like illness. Um, if you're lucky, that's all you'll get. Um, the second stage usually starts a week after that. That's when um, the what they call the pulmonary phase, the lung phase, where your lung starts getting severely inflamed. Yeah. Um, that's when you get short of breath and you might need oxygen. That's when you should get checked out. Um, the third phase is when the immune system goes really out of whack and um, you end up critically ill and near death. Um, that doesn't happen to everybody. And that you need to be in an ICU or and getting special treatments uh, for that. And then there's um, the fourth phase, sort of a very long phase after that um, is lasting months, which they're calling long COVID, where you have these chronic symptoms of trouble breathing, chest pain, uh, fatigue, brain fog that can last um, six to eight months. They don't know because a lot of people still haven't resolved from them. Um, some people oh, okay. it's just a few weeks, some people it's six months, it's hard to say. Nobody knows why it's happening and nobody has any treatments for it. So I know a lot of people are talking about that, that fourth stage yeah. uh, of COVID. And <laughs> uh, so, so that is, sounds pretty serious considering they don't know how long it can last. Exactly. Like you're seeing able-bodied, healthy people suddenly, you know, severely disabled. Um, and who knows how long for it could be permanent. Um, that's another thing you don't want. Like, even if you are, don't get severe COVID, you could still get this long COVID. Um, and I think something like 10 to 20% of people with the moderate illness will get it. Um, it's still not, the numbers are still up there, but you know, if you're at the peak of your career, you're at the peak of your health to get struck down by something that you could prevent is, is really is a real tragedy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, Thank you for sharing that. Cause again, for, for me, I wasn't aware that there was this fourth stage. Um, and, and then just to tap into the second stage, how long are, does that typically last? And, and how many um, people are getting? About a week or two. Um, and, but usually like, if you're really ill, you're in hospital by then. Um, so the first week it's like, um, like look at Trump. Trump probably was sick in the, right around the time he had his debate with Biden. Yeah. Then he went to hospital about five days later. Um, so he probably got sick two days before the debate. Five to seven days is when the second stage starts. That's when he was hospitalized and given that treatment. And then he turned around, but a lot of people don't. And they end up uh, in the ICU on a ventilator. And that could be for a long time. And then there's a very high mortality rate if you're on the ventilator, which is like about a third to half of people usually. Okay. And then is... To Everyone getting the same treatment when they come in uh, to the hospital? Uh, mostly because there's not a lot of treatments. Right. Oxygen and supportive care. Yeah. Medication wise, it's um, the trials have been um, have shown that a couple of medications work like um, steroids at a certain stage. Um, there's still trials coming in for other medications, but um, they'll be used mostly in the ICU and other settings. Um, no silver bullet that you can take a pill right when you get early infected, it'll stop it. Um, the, the Regeneron treatment that Trump got um, is there's only 50,000 doses in the world and you have to take it in the first stage in the first week. And so how, who gets it and how they get it and how they pay for it. That's such a huge question. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's not even a practical solution right now. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, those were all the questions I had. Uh, I guess the last one would be, what is your message? And I think you've kind of shared that for everyone uh, about maintaining social distance and wearing masks. But is there anything else you want to share with the listeners in terms of going forward? Um, yeah, what are some of the things we need to be mindful of? And then what to do when the vaccine starts coming out and stuff like that? I think, you know, like I mentioned before, stick, watch the public health um, directions carefully. Um, you know, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Like we're halfway through it. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, light on the, on the horizon. Uh, we're, you know, four or five months away from real good vaccines. 
So I think this is a good, this is not a good time to give up faith on it. You know, keep doing what you're doing because it's working. Um, keep, uh, keep safe. Don't fall into the, the COVID fatigue. Um, and, you know, like, be proud of yourself. Like, uh, the public largely has come through and really, really done something amazing. And, and I think keep that up and um, we'll see you on the other side, hopefully. Yeah. And during the vaccine, I think, um, you know, watch the studies carefully. I think they're going to be safe. Um, I'm going to look at them very carefully because I'm going to be one of the healthcare workers that are going to be the first guinea pigs to get them. Um, so, yeah, if, watch for the safety data. But I think overall it looks pretty good. Um, it's going to be a safe vaccine to take and you know it is the best shot that we have to going back to normal life well no thanks for sharing that and i think uh you know even just sharing the the same message and kind of cautioning people and uh highlighting the seriousness behind this uh coronavirus is uh is important and i'm i'm you know grateful for you to doing for doing this and yeah thank you for being a first line worker like for putting yourself at risk every day for the general public. I think, you know, uh, we're not doing enough to thank the people that are kind of behind the scenes doing all the work. And, uh, you know, I hope everyone feels the same way and echoes my comments. <laughs> thank you so much. That's way to thank us is wear a mask and stay yeah. safe. All right. Well, thanks, Kasha, for uh, coming on the podcast and sharing the message. And yeah, I, it was really insightful and for me, informative, because there's a lot of things I didn't know that was going on uh, around this virus. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Good luck. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. There you go, everyone. That's the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you can leave a review, I will really appreciate it. Your reviews will allow me to get better and improve my messaging. Thank you. And until next time.